You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, Internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Most writers and radio show hosts know that to connect with your fans, you need to do more than just write books or record the latest podcasts. There are many different elements that go into forming an online platform, but there are also many hidden traps. To make matters worse, solid advice on how to survive the muddy waters is scarce. In the book Hidden Traps, I talk about some of the important issues of working with an online platform, highlighting traps that could put your physical or internet security at risk, or be harmful to your reputation. Are your social media posts just links with a few disjointed words making you look like someone who can't complete a sentence? Did your new website cost you more than you anticipated? Are you leaking your personal contact details across the web without even knowing it? Then you need Hidden Traps. Hidden Traps is now available in paperback and ebook from a variety of retailers, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Kobo. Visit blackwolfpublications.com for more details. Not on my watch, our military service members say, as they volunteer to serve, as they move out, stand firm, and take fire. So not on our watch, we say, to the severely ill or injured veterans who can't get the care they deserve to live full and independent lives, even when there's no government funding or a nursing home seems like the only option. We won't leave one warrior behind. Not on our watch. Join us at findwwp.org. If you're 85 or younger, would you like peace of mind and comfort for your family? We're Final Expense Direct with an urgent message for you. The average funeral today costs over $8,000, but the most you'll get from government benefits is $255. How will your family pay the difference? We can help. Our senior plans start as low as just a dollar a day and pay up to $30,000 for a funeral and other final expenses. Peace of mind is easy. There's no medical exam. You'll have lifetime coverage, and your plan can't be canceled as long as you pay your premiums. Call now for free information about our senior plans. Answer a few simple questions and receive approval right on the phone. Plus, call right now and we'll give you a discount prescription card for free. Call 800-553-8687. That's 800-553-8687. Again, 800-553-8687. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. Everyone loves liberty. Our rights come from God, not the government. So why are you letting other people tell you what's best for your health care? Exercise your freedom with Liberty HealthShare. Liberty HealthShare is a community of people who voluntarily share one another's medical costs. Liberty HealthShare is founded on the idea that most people truly want to help one another. Healthcare sharing allows members to do just that as a true community that supports one another in times of need. Liberty believes people should make decisions for themselves and their families. Members are able to take back the freedom to make their own decisions about their health care. Freedom from guilt or doubt about how your money is used. You have the freedom to direct your health care, not to be dictated to by bureaucrats. Stop letting others tell you what to do and join a community of like-minded people. Exercise your freedom. Join Liberty HealthShare and take back the control of your health care while helping those around you. Call Liberty at 855-58-LIBERTY. Again, that's 855-58-L-I-B-E-R-T-Y for more information. Or you can check them out at libertyhealthshare.org. Again, that's libertyhealthshare.org. Here's George Foreman with Invent Health. Hi, I'm George Foreman. Do you have an idea for a new product or invention? People ask me all the time, George, how do I get my idea in front of companies? How do I get a patent? What do I do next? Do you have the same questions? I'll tell you like I'll tell them all. Call my friends at Invent Help. Call Invent Help today for free information. Invent Help has been helping inventors for more than 30 years and has sales offices nationwide. Invent Help can submit your invention to companies who are interested in receiving new 
new ideas. If you have an idea and want to try to patent it and submit it to companies, you should call InventHelp today for free information. Listen, I can't guarantee a company will be interested in your idea, but I believe every inventor deserves the opportunity to step into the ring and take their best shot. Put InventHelp in your corner. Get your free inventor's information. Call 1-800-353-6490. That's 1-800-353-6490. Again, 1-800-353-6490. At St. Jude, a family never sees a bill at all. It's like the world has been lifted off of your shoulders. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Finding cures. Saving children. Learn more at stjude.org. Sometimes riders feel lost, unsure why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our riding into full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable riders to develop and grow, offering manuscript critiques and line edits through a mentoring editorial style. We also offer assistance on generating a rider's bio for your websites. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your riding into maturity. For a full list of services, visit blackwolfeditorial.com. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Sometimes we need to slow down and remember the simple pleasures in life. Good coffee, good books, and good company. Come on in. Take a seat. The coffee's just been brewed. Let's see who we have in the coffee shop today. What a beautiful day in the coffee shop. Joanne, Joanne Franklin, how are you? I'm fine. How are you, Jesse? I'm doing great. Did you bring me an, a copy of the Raindrop Institute? I did. Ooh. It should be on your coffee table. Awesome! I see it there. I can't wait to dive into it. But we're going to talk about it first. I think you'll like it. I'm happy to discuss anything about it. Oh, awesome, awesome. What genre is it? It's women's fiction. That's what I prefer it to be called. But it's, I also think it's probably literary fiction. And then there's a sprinkle of saga in it as well. Oh boy, sounds fascinating. Tell me a little bit about the plot. The plot is about an older woman and her four renters who try to save the world from civilization collapse. They are reluctant superheroes at the very best, but they give it their all. And they begin, or Dart begins, Dart Summers is the protagonist in the story. She is a, has a PhD in psychology, and she has issues with her father. So the story begins with her father having an accident and she goes to him and in the week that he takes to die she discovers all sorts of things she did not understand and that in turn gives her the courage and the strength to face the problems that face the world and start a think tank. Wow. That sounds fascinating. So we've got the four, the five reluctant heroes, and the. Uh, you said it was Dart was your main character. Dart is the main character. Yes, she is a divorced single woman. She's in her late fifties, and she's just starting a career in academia. So not only does she have this, does she have a research agenda that folks don't particularly find appealing because it brings bad news to the front door and who wants that. But it's pertinent because civilization class has happened at least six times in civilization's history. 
And it's always from the same cause. Politicians start kicking the can down the road on problems and say, oh, we can't fix that today, but tomorrow we'll do. And then they make bad decisions, like to cut down all of the trees along the equator so that the climate heats up. Or they do as the Mayans did. They sacrifice virgins to stop the drought. We had one California legislator a few years ago suggest to the California Assembly that if they passed a bill prohibiting abortion within the state, as Texas did, or restricting abortion within the state, as Texas did, that their drought would end because oh. Texas drought ended when they looked at that law again. Okay. That sounds like a coincidence to me. And I produce and co-host another show on the station called Conversation, Conversations in Science. And I have a feeling Doc would blow that theory out of the water. What would he say? Well, D- Dr. Judy L. Moore would probably say that is the biggest piece of fake science. It needs a bounce out. That's exactly right. And Dora would be right there with her. I mean, because you can't, you can't stop droughts by sacrificing virgins as the Mayans did, and you curtain, certainly can't stop droughts by repealing by abortion cre- as have- you wanted the California legislature. I'm sorry. You might be able to stop drought by seeding the clouds. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You might. And so, you know, Dart takes a look at all of those things. She's particularly interested in why the Midwest and West, the Western towns are the smaller ones, are drying up. Why students and children, why the children don't stay. And so she, one of the issues that she tackles with her four renters in the Raindrop Institute is to figure out what has happened to those towns and why the kids don't stay there, why they go off to Chicago or New York or Dallas. That's pretty interesting. I know one thing I prob one reason I'd probably have struggle in a small town though. You know, you you might. I like super fast internet. (laughs) <laughs> that's that's one of the issues, but internet is coming to the Midwest. It's it's there already. Technology is there. Technology is it's, there, but if you're way out in a small town, sometimes mm-hmm. you can't get high speed, true high speed internet. That's true. You can't. So, but you you know, there's other things that you can do. You know, it, but the issue for Dart is, and what what she knows to be fact is that it's really, really hard to leave your family and friends back home while you go away to a bigger city. And what she and her renters discovered, the raindrops discovered, when they looked at this complex problem, was that the people in the small towns told their best and brightest to leave. And they've been doing it for decades. And it's no wonder that the small towns are drying up. Yeah, no kidding. If you tell someone to leave, they probably will. They they feel yes. unwanted. Well-meaning parents, well-meaning teachers, your future is elsewhere. It's not here. And so they mean well. But in doing what's best for the child or what they think is best for the child, they're actually destroying the town. Wow. I know if somebody told me to leave, I probably would. But sure, if I could get everything I needed in that said small town, because I've visited some really small, tiny towns over my life, and I love them. I love the atmosphere. If I could get everything mm-hmm. I needed in a small town, I'd have no problem with it. <laughs> it's an interesting thing. I, I thought I was really kind of at the forefront of uh, the research on this when I wrote the book. And the book has been out and it came out in the latter part of April. Yesterday's Wall Street Journal had an article about why kids are leaving small towns. And one of the issues was the senior in question had an $18,000 a year 
scholarship, swimming scholarship, to attend a particular university. She lasted a week because it was so very, very different than her hometown. A week? Now, a week. And she had basically had tuition and fees paid for and a little bit left over for, a four, I assume, a four-year scholarship. But it is such a gigantic leap uh, that a lot of the kids are not prepared. And then the second thing that keeps small towns, people from leaving small towns, is that if you're a janitor or a hairdresser, you might be able to live in a small town, but if you try to take your your skills to New York City, rent, high-speed internet, et cetera, would take about 52% of your salary instead of just the 15% that's in small towns. So that contributes to the problem. We We tell our best and brightest to leave. They listen to us. Those who can't afford to leave stay and watch the town die. It's really an interesting phenomenon. And for the first time in America's history, over half of the population now lives in big cities. So this is a sea change for the United States. We've never had this happen before. Wow, I didn't realize that. You know so much about this. What's your background? (laughs) My background is I was born and raised in a small town on a century farm. And I met and married my husband, had two kids, and then had to go to work to put my kids through college. And so I became a school teacher. Then I became a high school principal. Then I got my Ph.D. in educational administration. And then I taught graduate college, graduate courses at Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas for 10 and a half years. Wow. And those graduate courses that I taught were all about decision making, ethical decision making, democracies in schools, how schools sustain democracies, and why complex problems are so very, very difficult to solve. That sounds fascinating, believe it or not. It really does. <laughs> but then I well, have such yeah. a varied interest. You'd be amazed what little things I'll pick up on. I, I hope so. You <laughs> could. <laughs> okay. My Kindle so that gives... has so many different books on it. I've got nonfiction. I've got fiction. I've got research papers that I found fascinating and picked up a copy of. And I've got all kinds of crazy things there. And that the research is fascinating into how the brain makes decisions. And Kahneman's work is phenomenal. There are uh, TED Talks on the subject. Uh, Psychology Today is a blog that I follow. And we think we know how our mind works, but we really don't. And so DART's emphasis with this think tank is to train her four renters, and these are all older women without college degrees, all of them impoverished, all of them trying to keep making a living, keep everything together and with not much money. But she trains them to think outside the box, to think differently about things. And so they come up with ideas such as our towns in the Midwest and in the, in the West wouldn't be dying if we didn't tell our kids to leave. She comes up with things such as If we had our seniors make up business plans for an independent business within towns before they went to college, they might come back and implement those businesses. I think so. There are a number of things. I I think it sounds like a great thing, and I love outside the box thinking. I think I'm really going to enjoy the Raindrop Institute. I hope so. It's my first novel. So there are some things that I probably should have done differently. But my passion for decision-making is there, and Dart shares that. And I love Dart's journey from overcoming her past and the, the issues in the relationship with her father that kept her 
grounded into old ways of thinking. And once he died, he set her free to take on these bigger issues and to help the world become a better place. Like I said, it sounds like a fascinating growth story of growth and development and the challenge. I'm sure she faces many challenges. Oh, she does. There are external challenges, such as a dean who doesn't particularly like her research on civilization class. He'd rather she do something that will help people, in his opinion. She has a colleague who doesn't particularly like her and who votes against her for promotion and tenure. So there are a lot of external obstacles that DART has to overcome. I can't wait to dig into it. So how long did it take you to write this novel? Oh, dear. It has been simmering for about uh, maybe 11, 12 years. But the actual writing took place over a period of four to five months. And then I got involved in editing the book and stalled out on editing the book. And so I released it in April, after about three years of starting it, from starting it, rather. I assume you got those edits finished first, though. I did. I did uh, did that right. I wrote the book, pushed it through a developmental editor and a editor for periods and misspelled words. I'm sure there are still a few in there, but probably not that many. He found a lot of them. And uh, then I had, uh, I sent it out to agents, and I had a number of agents who were interested in it. I had one agent who picked it up, but then she had family issues that happened, and I'm not getting any younger, so I entered the book in a Kindle Scout competition just to see what it would do. All right, what is a Kindle Scout competition? I didn't know anything about it either. Kendall Scout is an Amazon competition where you send them your ebook and on their website they put your book cover up, they put a brief blurb up, and they have three topics. There are hot and trending, there are beginning and ending soon. And you've got 30 days to generate interest in your book. And that interest in the book transforms itself into clicks to move your book up into hot and trending. So someone will go on the site, see the Raindrop Institute, and say, yep, I nominate you. And click it and you got one step farther into hot and trending. The goal goal at first seemed to be to get a lot of hours in hot and trending so that your book would look popular to Kendall Scott editors who would then make a decision, yay or nay, as to whether they wanted to publish the book under the Amazon brand. But then I started going on to a site in the Writer's Cafe on K-Boards about Kendall Scout. And the writers there were writers who had a ton of books behind their names, anywhere from three to four. They were savvy people who understood that the the real gold with Kendall Scout wasn't whether or not you were chosen for a book contract, but the publicity that you got when your book was out there. And so that's why Kendall, that's why the Raindrop Institute did so well when it first came out. You know, I, I rewarded those who had voted for me. I think I had a, like 1,900 votes. Wow. Which is, yeah, it's, it's, it's not bad. And I rewarded them by giving it away for free, and 300 
350 people picked it up within two days. So, so did- it it did get the book out there. It did get some um, marketing behind it, and it did get some visuals behind it. They The good part for me was that they didn't reject it out of hand like the very last day it came off the list. They took their sweet time about it, considered it for a week, and then decided to tell me no. Yeah, but you still got a lot of attention for it, so there's something to be said for that. You too. The negatives about Kendall Scout are you don't think you're going to be affected because you have a book out there for 30 days in front of the public and you've got to generate interest in it. You don't think it's going to affect you. You don't think you're going to worry about it. And you find yourself checking every 30 minutes to see whether it's still on Hot and Trending. (laughs) I can believe it. (laughs) You too. It is uh, the psychological game. You really get you get involved in the competition, you want it to do well, and you check, and you double-check, and you recheck. And the veterans, the ones who, who have been through this competition with their first book, their second book, their third book, and their fourth book, they understand that there's really nothing you can do to influence whether or not Amazon's going to pick it up other than to have, one, a good cover, two, a good blurb, three, a very good opening, and four, a good story. Because although the public, the the people who are voting, don't get to read all of the manuscript, the Kendall book editors do. I mean, the Kendall Scout editors do. Well, that sounds fascinating. So I assume they put up a little excerpt about the book or the blurb. You know, you said they put up the blurb. Do they also do a little excerpt? They do, the first 5,000 words. So would you recommend Kindle, entering the Kindle Scout competition for self, people who want to go the more self-published route? You know, I think I would. I think I would. And I think that I would, if I had to do it over again, I would wait for my second or third book because the attention that you get from readers who like your work means that they'll go on to your website or to Amazon, wherever you have your first book posted, and they might pick it up as well while they're waiting to see how your second or third book do. So the, the savvy writers who have entered their books into competition with Kendall Scout understand that. They understand that traffic will be driven to their site, that the whole competition is also a marketing ploy for them, especially if they have other books in the pipeline. And they can get their books before a lot more people. So that would be the only caveat that I would have. I I don't think I would do it again for a first book, but I think I would do it again if I were a writer who has had who has had several books under my belt. That's great. Now you mentioned that you used not one but two outside editors. Was I assume that's something you plan to do again in the future for your next book as well. Yes. I I'm a firm believer that if you self publish, you run your book, you spend the money up front and run your book through a developmental editor and also a copy editor. And there will still be mistakes in the book, but there will be less of them. And I know that with my book, the uh, Kindle version is in vellum, and it's, it, its appearance is much nicer than the paperback book. Because I, put, I published the paperback book through KD Press, And it's still a fledgling effort on Amazon's part. And so I will, once I find some room to breathe in the writing process, I plan to do something differently with that paperback book. But the Kindle book, I I like it. I like it in vellum. It's it's a lovely way to to publish an e-book. Well, that sounds like great advice for up-and-coming writers as well. I think so. The... The 
advice to up and coming writers can is rather succinct. It's put your best writing forward, take the time you need to write a good book, and then send it out to developmental editor to a developmental editor, make those changes. For example, in the in the book that I'm currently working on, my developmental editor asked me to combine one combine two characters into one. She asked me to toss out another character and then she asked me to get the emotional arc between Dart and her love interest in in this particular book uh, more clearly defined. And so they you've got to spend time with that. And even though I hate it, I have my computer read the scenes aloud to me. And that means every scene in the book. And it's amazing what you can pick up with dialogue that sounds stuffy or not as smooth as it should be or not as snappy as you want it to be. You find those things when the computer in that mechanical voice is reading your words back to you. Well, I, funny you mentioned reading things out loud. I beta read for a number of my writing friends because, as I mentioned off air, I'm no writer. I've tried. It's just not my passion. But I love to read. I've been told I'll read this. I've been caught. I've caught myself read, reading the cereal box at, on the breakfast table. <laughs> I will read anything I can get my hands on, and I've been that way as long as I can remember. Well, then I should send this book to you and have you read it as a beta reader. We'll talk about that off the air. <laughs> but the one thing, and I've I've. I've had an editor on my show, who, you know, Dr. Judy L. Moore. She's also a freelance editor. She wears a number of hats. It's amazing how she pops up in my life sometimes. But the one thing she always told, has always stresses to writers, don't rush the process. She, no, you really, really can't. She has stopped a number of self-pub people from putting, oh, I don't have the money for an editor, so I'm just going to put it out there and then take it down, and then I'll do the edits when they find the mistakes for me and put it back up. That's I, not a good way to go. She's absolutely right. And she has stopped that from happening a number of times. So, because she's also involved in a number of writing groups, both both Facebook chat groups and forums and things like that. So I think that's the one thing I've learned about writing is don't rush the process. It is. It takes time to find out what it is you are really writing about. And I know with the Raindrop Institute, I got to the end of the book and then went back through it again and back through it again and back through it again to figure out what it was I was really writing about. And it just takes time because the brain isn't that quick at writing. It's uh, it's an awkward task for us to do. I think that is outstanding advice. And Joanne, I'm going to have to ask you if we can just hang on for just a minute, a couple minutes. We got to take those, pay those radio station bills and take one of those pesky commercial breaks. Look forward to the break. All right. I will see you on the other side. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. 
Most writers and radio show hosts know that to connect with your fans, you need to do more than just write books or record the latest podcasts. There are many different elements that go into forming an online platform, but there are also many hidden traps. To make matters worse, solid advice on how to survive the muddy waters is scarce. In the book Hidden Traps, I talk about some of the important issues of working with an online platform, highlighting traps that could put your physical or internet security at risk or be harmful to your reputation. Are your social media posts just links with a few disjointed words making you look like someone who can't complete a sentence? Did your new website cost you more than you anticipated? Are you leaking your personal contact details across the web without even knowing it? Then you need Hidden Traps. Hidden Traps is now available in paperback and ebook from a variety of retailers, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Kobo. Visit blackwolfpublications.com for more details. As a mother, you don't want to have to worry about this bill is coming, but then she needs this chemo. That's a decision you shouldn't have to make. It's a huge burden lifted financially, and so it allows you to give singular focus to your child. I've never known a hospital that takes care of their patients so thoroughly. That was the first thing I was like, how are we going to do this? When they told us that we didn't have to pay a single bill, I was like, wow. They pretty much have saved us. It's like the world has been lifted off of your shoulders. And now your focus is supporting this child. There is not another hospital like St. Jude. The patient care is unmatchable. It saved my life. It saved my daughter's life. It saved our family. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Finding cures. Saving children. Learn more at stjude.org. If you're 85 or younger, would you like peace of mind and comfort for your family? We're Final Expense Direct with an urgent message for you. The average funeral today costs over $8,000, but the most you'll get from government benefits is $255. How will your family pay the difference? We can help. Our senior plans start as low as just a dollar a day and pay up to $30,000 for a funeral and other final expenses. Peace of mind is easy. There's no medical exam. You'll have lifetime coverage, and your plan can't be canceled as long as you pay your premiums. Call now for free information about our senior plans. Answer a few simple questions and receive approval right on the phone. Plus, call right now and we'll give you a discount prescription card for free. Call 800-553-8687. That's 800-553-8687. Again, 800-553-8687. We're all part of your community. We all play a role in keeping our community safe. So protect your every day. If you see something suspicious, say something to local authorities. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. Everyone loves liberty. Our rights come from God, not the government. So why are you letting other people tell you what's best for your health care? Exercise your freedom with Liberty HealthShare. Liberty HealthShare is a community of people who voluntarily share one another's medical costs. Liberty HealthShare is founded on the idea that most people truly want to help one another. Healthcare sharing allows members to do just that as a true community that supports one another in times of need. Liberty believes people should make decisions for themselves and their families. Members are able to take back the freedom to make their own decisions about their health care. Freedom from guilt or doubt about how your money is used. You have the freedom to direct your health care, not to be dictated to by bureaucrats. Stop letting others tell you what to do and join a community of like-minded people. Exercise your freedom. Join Liberty HealthShare and take back the control of your health care while helping those around you. Call Liberty at 855-58-LIBERTY. Again, that's 855-58-L-I-B-E-R-T-Y for more information. Or you can check them out at libertyhealthshare.org. Again, that's libertyhealthshare.org. 
Here's George Foreman with InventHelp. Hi, I'm George Foreman. Do you have an idea for a new product or invention? People ask me all the time, George, how do I get my idea in front of companies? How do I get a patent? What do I do next? Do you have the same questions? I'll tell you like I'll tell them all. Call my friends at InventHelp. Call InventHelp today for free information. InventHelp has been helping inventors for more than 30 years and has sales offices nationwide. InventHelp can submit your invention to companies who are interested in receiving new ideas. If you have an idea and want to try to patent it and submit it to companies, you should call InventHelp today for free information. Listen, I can't guarantee a company will be interested in your idea, but I believe every inventor deserves the opportunity to step into the ring and take their best shot. Put InventHelp in your corner. Get your free inventor's information. Call 1-800-353-6490. That's 1-800-353-6490. Again, 1-800-353-6490. At St. Jude, a family never sees a bill at all. It's like the world has been lifted off of your shoulders. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Finding cures. Saving children. Learn more at stjude.org. Sometimes riders feel lost, unsure why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our riding into full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable riders to develop and grow, offering manuscript critiques and line edits through a mentoring editorial style. We also offer assistance on generating a rider's bio for your websites. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your riding into maturity. For a full list of services, visit blackwolfeditorial.com. Well, thank y'all for hanging in there with me while we paid those radio station bills. Yes, got to take care of the necessities as well as have fun. So, Joanne, thank you for hanging. Awesome. Thank you for hanging in there with me. Now, are you you a plotter or a pantser? Do you sit down and outline your book and you know where it's going and you know every detail before you write it? I didn't, uh, I didn't used to be a plotter. I have since changed my ways. I am older, and I no longer have time to waste trying to figure out where it is I'm going. So at this stage of my writing career, I plot. I make certain that scene scene one goes into scene two and I understand where I want my protagonist to be at the end of the story. Now, do you you write a detailed outline where you already know every little bit about that scene or do you go go, A has to happen, B has to happen, C has to happen, how we're going to get from A to B and B to C, I don't know? I've done it numerous ways. There are so many books out there about plotting, and I would imagine that I have read most of them. I've uh, looked at Story Grid and taken some things from it, Save the Cat and taken things from that, Screenplay Outline. Um, You have to have six things that are going on in Chapter 1, and those take you through the movie, or I mean, through the story. And then I just, I'm just now immersed in story, a story, a story genius course that I'm taking online to figure out the characters in the third book of this Raindrop Institute series. And I actually like her way of plotting out a book. And Lisa Cron is her name, C-R-O-N. And she has a story genius scene card that you write out. And you give the alpha plot, you give the subplot, you then give what happens in the external plot, and then the consequences of that external thought, and then you go to the internal, and that is why does it matter, and then the realization that comes about in that scene, and then you get to the end, so, which is the action that the character does at the end of the scene that sets up 
the next scene. So it's a it's a plotting method that allows you deep insight into your character. For example, the character in this book is Dart Summer's nephew, Robbie. And Robbie is a water witch, a dowser. And you know what that is, right? No, do tell. Okay. We had dowsers growing up on the farm. Uh, They would come in and find wells that were underground and pockets of water that, that you could drill down into and you'd have a well. And they, some dowsers can divert underground streams through to aquifers. But they usually hold a rod in their hand that's shaped up to a twig, a piece of a limb that's shaped in a V. And they hold the V part in both hands and the pointing end is stretched out before them. So it's like they're holding on to a plow. And they walk. And when that limb dips down, through no fault of their own, the force of the water is pulling it down through them, they have found water. And that's how a number of wells are are drilled in rural areas. That's how most of them are drilled in rural areas. A dowser will come in and find the water. Now, the interesting thing about dowsers is that some of them have a proclivity for finding people as well. Wow. Others others have a proclivity for finding illnesses within the body because the body is composed mostly of water. And so you can take it any way you like. You can, you know, you could, you can have, I could have had Robbie uh, participate in search and rescue work, rescue missions and finding lost people on mountainsides, or I could have had him working to divert underground streams into dying aquifers in California. There are all sorts of ways to figure out what Robbie should do with this gift that he has. But the interesting thing about story genius is that in going into his background, which, of course, you know, you're making this character up from from your imagination. You can create any kind of background you want. But what he encounters in first grade sets him up for his future activities. So Robbie isn't that particular, isn't particularly good at finding lost people. But he is good at finding water, and he is good at diverting underground streams, and he is great at getting water to come to his rescue whenever he needs it. For example, he can bring an underground stream up up to the surface of the earth of the earth and perform a little magic for everybody and then send it back down. And he's also good at predicting what illness you have and what you're going to die from. He sounds like a fascinating character, and he's in the second book? He's in the first book as a young boy. He's in the second book as a teenager, and he's in the third book as a young man who's, who has to leave the place that he finds most comfortable, the farm, and come to North Carolina and help his Uncle Dart. He calls her Uncle Dart because She's always wanted to be not a man. She's always wanted to be valued in a man's world for her intellect, for her accomplishments, until she realizes that that's not really what counts. That sounds fascinating. Like I said, I love repeat guests, but we'll talk more about that off the air. Okay. All right. So anyway, back to your question. Uh, I'm now plotting out Robbie's story. And the story genius card allows me to have the external plot with all of the action that drives that and the internal arc with all of the growth that engages the reader. And I sort of like story genius for that because Save the Cat, Story Grid, 
the others that I've had that I've read, the other books, most of the other books, they're all about plot. The only other book that I've read that gets into internal motivation and more into how a writer can express that is Donald Moss's latest book. And that's that's a very good one as well. Well, those sound like things that every... <clears throat> those sound like books that every writer should have in their collection then. Yeah. I, I would uh, I would recommend both of them. Donald Moss's latest and Story Genius by Lisa Cohn. So it sounds like you do a fair bit of plotting now. Has that impacted how are you one of these scheduled people you get up every day and you have breakfast and then you go to the computer and you write at the same time every day i try to do that but uh, most days that doesn't work what i am is one of these people who goes to bed at night and this is going to sound very weird you'll have to tell me if there's any science behind it because i'm afraid to look i go to bed And I ask myself a question about where the book goes next or about the character that's been troubling me. When I wrote uh, The Raindrop Institute, the, the first book that we're talking about tonight, one of the questions that I asked myself is, should Dart have a love interest with the dean? And the answer I woke up with in the morning was no. That would spoil the whole entire book, what you're trying to accomplish. You want her to stand on her own two feet without relying on love because she's lost her father. And you want her to tackle problems uh, with logic and reason and insight. And if she's distracted by a love interest, that can't happen. So for this book, you're going to have to bite the bullet and don't put any romance in it. And I like a romantic story. Romance can be fun, but like I said, I'll read just about anything, including the cereal box, if it sits in front of me long (laughs) enough. (laughs) A lot of writers read a lot, and they have to know their craft to read it, which is why... I'm a little bit of an anomaly because I tend to read science fiction, mysteries, and romance rather than literary fiction. But I think that's because I taught English for a number of years and and read a number of literary fiction. So, so you all could be why you understand all the all th- all three or four of those genres. And my I re- do, and as and as a child, I loved Bain Gray. My reason for saying that is I'm going to pick on my my favorite well-known author. I've got a few favorite self-pub and indie pub, but my favorite well-known author is a thriller writer. And who would that be? Brad Thor. Oh, uh, And yes. the advice he likes to give to writers is don't write what you know, write what you read, because you understand what you, the pace that you like and the what you like to see in plots and how fast the story should go and all those little bits of bits and pieces. And he says, basically, if that's the genre you, you gravitate to reading or you have read a lot in, you basically have a mini PhD in that area. Yes. I think, I think that uh, he's right. I think that you absorb a lot when you read fiction And that when it comes time to write that fiction, or write fiction like what you're reading, you can sense pace, and you can sense pauses, and you can sense whether the dialogue should be a sparkling repertoire between two people or more pedantic. You know, yeah, he's absolutely right. And the other thing he always says and I'm going back to how you get the answers to your questions and plot twists. He says he gets mm-hmm. his best ideas. He always says in the shower, but he's like, it's when your brain is relaxed, <laughs> when you're not paying attention to writing, you're not focused on writing. That's when you'll yes. work out those problems. That is. I know that the answer is usually there in my head when I wake up in the morning. I also know that 
when I come to a point in the novel, in the work that I just can't think around if I get up and walk around for five minutes or run in place for a minute, I come back to the computer and the knowledge is there. What I need is there. So sometimes you have to step away from your brain and the engagement and seek some quiet time and the answer floats to the surface. Why didn't I do, Why didn't I see that before? Of course she has to do this or that. I think it's great. So let's talk book covers for just a moment. Did okay. you design your own book cover or did you pay to have one professionally done? A little bit of both. My daughter is a graphic designer and she also does Photoshop. We were on a trip together along the East Coast and she put together a scene that had the ocean, and then it had two spiraling staircases, one of which was lying on its side and the other was standing upright, coming out of the surf. So she found those that spiral staircase in an old bookshop along the coast where we were vacationing. She photoshopped them so that the spiral staircase looks as if it's coming, looks as if it's lying in the ocean and then all of a sudden coming out of the ocean. And I liked that picture. I like the imagery of it. I like the metaphor of it, that from the depths of your organic self, knowledge can, can arise. And sometimes you don't get it right, but eventually you do. You stair-step your way out of the deep, out of the depth. And I sent that picture that that Stephanie composed to a a cover designer. And she used it and uh, punched it up a little bit and put the, the words in the right place, in the right type and uh, put it all together. So I I did both. Well, that's great, because while they don't say, while they always say don't judge a book by its cover, everybody does. Everybody does. And it's always a wise decision for writers, I think, to run that cover past people, the, the targeted audience, the age group that you want to read your book, the gender that you want to read your book, run it past as many people as you can. Do you like this cover? Or do you like that cover? Or, you know, ask for opinions on your cover. Uh, Some people, another good bit of advice is, will the cover look good in a thumbnail sketch on on Amazon? Because that's what e-books are all about. And you can have a good cover in a paperback, on a paperback that doesn't translate well to that little thumb size photo for your ebook. That's something I'd never thought about. So that's a, that's a great idea. It has to look good small as well as paperback size. That's awesome that you actually thought about all those items. It sounds like you're quite the decision maker yourself. <laughs> I read a lot as you do. And uh, now if I can get marketing to uh makes sense in my head, but uh, unfortunately right now it's not. But it's simply a matter of reading a bit more and making some decisions as to which way to go. It all takes time. It all takes time. It does. Now, is there anything else that you wanted to bring up in the interview that I have, we haven't already touched on? No, you, you, I have enjoyed our conversation immensely. And I hope that you enjoy reading the Raindrop Institute. Oh, I can't! I can't wait. So, when's when's the sequel coming out? <laughs> the sequel should be coming out in the fall, late awesome. fall, I think. Awesome! That sounds like fun. All right. Well, like I do with every guest at the end of an episode, why don't you share your social media contact information? <laughs> You can find me on Facebook at uh, www.joannefranklinwriter.com. 
I also have a website um, that is joannefranklinwriter.com, but I'm changing that. So, All right, Joanne, at this point of the show, before we say goodbye and I get to settle in with the Raindrop Institute, I like to give all my guests a chance to share their social media information. All right, you can find me on Facebook at joannefranklinwriter.com. You can also find me on Twitter at jfranklinwriter. All right. And for all of you out there wanting to track me down, you can find me on Twitter at Jesse's POV. Or you can always drop me a line at the station, Jesse, J E S S I E, at klrnradio.com. And I think it is time to pour myself a cup of coffee. And settle all on in with the Raindrop Institute, and I will see you next week back here in the coffee shop.